Hello, and welcome back to this uh, wonderful Global Leadership Roundtable virtual discussion. Uh, joining us today from around the world are many guests. Uh, this is a program uh, virtual roundtable organized and brought to you by the Churchill Institution of East Africa in cooperation and consultation with America's National Churchill Museum. My name is Tim Riley. Uh, I'm the director and chief curator here at America's National Churchill Museum joining you virtually from our Clementine Spencer Churchill Reading Room uh, at the museum here at Westminster College uh, in Fulton, Missouri. Uh, for today's final session, uh, we are very pleased to be joined by US uh, Navy Vice Admiral, Admiral Michael T. Franken. And it's my pleasure to introduce him to you today. Uh, Admiral Franken will deliver uh, a keynote speech uh, on leadership uh, that we're all very much looking forward to. Uh, Admiral Franken served as the U.S. Africa Command's Deputy for Military Operations, appropriate considering our hosts today. I know he's visited Uganda and is familiar with the territory, so we're very eager to hear his thoughts uh, about Africa uh, today. Uh, his formative uh, operational assignments uh, were in guided missile destroyers during his long and illustrious career in the U.S. Navy. He was, most notably, the first commanding officer of the USS Winston S. Churchill, uh, and he served admirably and with distinction uh, on that famous vessel named for the great statesman that we all admire and respect today. Uh, he also was the Commodore uh, as Commodore, he commanded the Destroyer Squadron 28 and Task Force Group 152 for the Eisenhower Strike Group. On land in Washington, D.C., he served a fellowship in congressional, for Congressional Affairs uh, for the Office of the Secretary of Navy uh, as the Political Military Chair in the Chief of Naval Operations Executive Panel Information, uh, Plans and Strategies Deep Blue Staff, also in the Assessments Division in support of the Navy's representation in the Joint Requirements Oversight Council and in the Joint Staff's Joint Operations Division. He presented the Worldwide Orders Book to Secretary Donald Rumsfeld from 2003 to 2005 and was the first military officer to serve as a legislative fellow for the Senator, late Senator Edward M. Kennedy. Uh, most notably and recently, Admiral Franken was inducted into the Association for Churchill Fellows here at Westminster College last month. We're very, very pleased to have with us, welcoming back uh, to Fulton and to the world, uh, Admiral Franken. Mike, glad to have you with us, um, and uh, it's great to see you today. Well, thank you, Tim, and, and hello to everyone. I am exceedingly honored to be involved in this, the inaugural Global Churchill Leadership Roundtable. I especially enjoy the use of time zones uh, from around the globe, even though I expect some friends along the far Pacific Rim may wish to host this event in the years to come to better accommodate their time zone. But thank you for being here. And thank you to the Churchill Institution of East Africa, the National Churchill Museum in beautiful Fulton, Missouri on this spring day and all the attendees who keep the Churchill leadership traits alive by passing along his grand history and sharing his hope through action for a better tomorrow. Now, I'm not an academic. I am an operator in life who happens to like Churchill's life stories. I especially like the books that tell of his bravado, grit, verve, intellect, and in some cases, a, a devil may care attitude. My Early Life, The River Wars, well, you know, most of his books on his life stories are fabulous. What I look for in reading about Churchill's life in a comparative way is the dividing line between situational leadership that required when making instantaneous decisions, decisions based on awareness, instinct, and there's something else versus grand leadership that required when history is at stake, when intellectual prescience about a future bigger than oneself is at risk. Now, few people in history are gifted with such a variety, a cornucopia of life's lessons as Churchill. Each in 
each of his life situations gave him a well-honed sense of both self-preservation, that kind of situational leadership that Sir Winston found so necessary in combat or in politics, since we know both can be equally fatal, and grand leadership, decisions made to corral a nation through a generational challenge like World War II. And here's the essence of my talk. It is about sizing up one's life's challenges against the principles of leadership that were so often standing before Sir Winston. When I was first informed that I'd be the commanding officer of a ship named after the prime minister back in 1997, well, I've been on a treadmill since to learn as much as I can on how that man thought. This isn't about 2020 hindsight. All his decisions in history are just that, made in an era and with the tools and the sets of tools and with that sense of understanding. My sense and reflection, or my study and reflection, as I mentioned, had more to do with how he thought, which brings me to a story that I think you'll appreciate. It has to do with the nation of Uganda and its brave soldiers, an American and even a Brit from Central Casting. It goes like this, it's a true story. Not far from Jenga, Uganda, on the east bank of the Victoria Nile, known as the White Nile by some, the Ugandans had a base, army base. And on this base, the United States had a program to prepare specialized soldiers to assist in the exodus of Al-Shabaab from Mogadishu, Somalia. Now this process is not for the faint of heart. It is a military operation, after all. The facility was okay, rustic, uh, but logistics to the base were edgy, especially by US standards. And the work, as you can imagine, was exceedingly serious. The US commander for me at the facility was a seasoned combat veteran Navy CB. A lot of time in Afghanistan, um, Iraq, et cetera. His job was to train a few platoons of Ugandan soldiers, all of whom, each individual, were combat veterans from the Udabag mission in Somalia. And our job was to train them with some specialized skills, complements of United States Navy SEALs and some Army Special Forces linguists. I needed a new person in charge. Well, an ideal vision of this person was not who walked through my door that day. She was a Navy helicopter pilot, a mere lieutenant. Mildly speaking, not the senior officer I was expecting. The look on the faces of my staff said so much. They were about to send, or we were about to send, a lieutenant to oversee a U.S. contingent of hardened combat veterans in a remote facility in which she isn't the senior person and has no experience in the mission set. My British colonel, who had grown up on the continent, raised a wary eyebrow. Frankly, if there is a list of qualifications for such a mission, she checked the box that says a military person. And after that, less so. This is situational leadership. Moreover, Churchill was very aware of how the bravery and verve of one person can endanger the lives of many more. This was to be avoided. A fleeting thought came to me about where might I place her on my staff, vice sending her forward. Then she began speaking. She wanted this challenge. She had no reservations, none. She had weighed what a lieutenant may have to deal with in a year long deployment, a long way from help. She was strident in her conviction. She had never commanded anything before other than perhaps a helicopter. 
she was stepping up to oversee a multinational mission on an unimproved facility on a continent far from home to train a cadre of men for a combat mission that will test the skill of even the most seasoned soldiers. With an abbreviated supporting cast of mostly contractors from other countries. She wasn't positive she could do it, but she was earnest in giving it her all. Well, I shook her hand. I signed a letter that said she represented my word on all matters, and I sent her on her way. Well, a few traits shine brightly throughout Churchill's lifelong litany of leadership. This lieutenant had many of them. She was positive and charismatic. She communicated well, stating her intention, her vision, her aim, her strengths, her potential shortcomings, and her optimism. She trusted the professionalism of her fellow soldiers and sailors. She trusted her instincts. She could influence, cajole, and rally. She was as resourceful as she was brave. <laughs> My immediate sense was she had both that Churchill's roar and that Churchill's claws. Most importantly, she had Churchill's ability to reason. I will save a tome's length of other such examples for another time. But if you ever think that Churchill's qualities of leadership are growing dormant in succeeding generations, think again. For it is the mission of this group hosting this roundtable for those from around the globe who have dialed in and all of us in our day-to-day -day occupations to educate and grow tomorrow's leaders. As exemplar, Churchill's trials are a good place to start. Well, so off went the lieutenant. <laughs> I visited the facility a few times over the course of the next year. There was a slew of issues, as there all were, always are, force protection concerns, injuries, logistical challenges, and she handled them all with a plume. She did her calling. And I expect the day that she left that facility, eager to go home, but she was regretful to leave. Uh, and the good news is I heard the soldiers from each nation line the roadway to give her a proper farewell departure. Well, in a few short months, Al-Shabaab was removed from Mogadishu, commendations to the Ugandan soldiers and the transitional federal government took over. So life consists of leadership flashes that happen every day and grander examples of leadership in a controlled, deliberative manner. Few people have that gift to do both so well. And I can think of no other person more fitting to talk about on the issue of leadership than Sir Winston Churchill. So thank you for listening to me. And I look forward to the next round of questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Admiral Franken, and uh, we're very pleased that you're, you're, you're able to share firsthand experience um, from uh, on the ground uh, and, and on the seas off the, off, off the coast of Africa. Um, you know, your, your, your experience and, and your questions about leadership uh, or your, your observations about leadership, and that's a, a wonderful example, um, are oftentimes, I think, called into question uh, by um, some of our younger generation wondering, well, why, why should we study um, Winston Churchill, uh, who was this perceived to be this, this you know, distant figure from another era, another time, born in the 19th century, lived into the, the 20th, you know, was a cigar chomping, you know, scotch swilling Englishman uh, who doesn't matter to me. You know, I don't have anything in common with, with, with this person. And you know, one of the obstacles we talked about it earlier in a session was that perhaps uh, the next generation or the next generations don't see an affinity with Winston Churchill. The principles of leadership perhaps are timeless, but how do we how do we make that connection, uh, perhaps 
to, um, to, to, to this individual or overcome that obstacle or barrier between what is perhaps a perceived perception of Churchill uh, and, and the principle of his leadership? Well, I think the story I just relayed, um, true to life, is indicative of you just never know. Now, this particular lieutenant was a distance runner. She joined the Navy pretty much on a whim because she was wanted to do something different in life. And she found herself, like I did at the time, in charge of ground forces in Africa. Um, so Churchill, although he sought out leadership challenges, you don't need to look far to have a situation in life where you are quite literally plopped down to do such missions. And I think knowing that uh, the elements to, uh, to proceed, to embark on an endeavor, to have that perspective, to have that huge quiver of experiences that you can relate to. All things in life have happened before. You just may not know about them. So in our case, reading of Churchill, reading of history, remarking, as I mentioned earlier, how uh, er, years ago, decades ago, I read the history of the Peloponnesian War, Thucydides. And I thought to myself, this happened last century, not, not a millennia ago, um, because it all comes around and, and, and occurs again. And human nature really doesn't change much. So um, I would say that um, the more you know, the more you realize there is to know and maintain a lifelong effort of learning. Agreed. And, and on that score, um, one of the topics that came up in an earlier session uh, was the idea of science and global uh, and, 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 and climate change uh, as, as a threat. We have a lot of global security threats in the world, but uh, one of the topics that seems to be emerging from our conversations uh, over the past two days is that um, you know there's there's a global health pandemic right now, but there's also um, a, a very real um, climate change threat. And and how do we as leaders, you know, tackle um, this unusual, uh, not unusual, but but uh, important threat? Uh, when, when we may be more traditionally uh, looking at uh, economic threats or military threats or terrorism and so forth, now we have a, a, a perhaps a, a different type of threat. You know, what, what should, what, what are the tools, the, the arrows in the quiver to use your term, uh, that leaders need to be looking at to, to tackle uh, these largest, largest you know, global threats? Well, with every dynamic in life, society, civilization, um, oftentimes they are a significant challenge, but they are a dynamic that can be, that is full of opportunities. So with the advent of ad admitting, first of all, climate change is real. It is something that's human caused and not nip around the edges about the nonsensical perspective that there's little we can do about it. Um, you embark on how can this make us better? So where can we help ourselves? Where can we look at climate change and, and then reflect back on, you know, we are just renting, we're just leasing our time on earth. Uh, we are just a passing wink of an eye. So it's, really not up to us to use this Earth's resources the way we have. We should be much more focused on preservation. And this is an opportunity to lower our carbon footprint and preserve what Mother Earth provides us. And it's due diligence for follow-on generations. I, I'm from rural Iowa. So farming is very much part of my blood. Farmers don't own their land, really. They are mere 
passerbys who live off its generosity. It's incumbent upon them to care for the land. That perspective is true for the person living in an apartment in New York City, in Saigon, in Tokyo. Um, it is true of all of us. The air we breathe, the water we use, what we consume, what we discharge is needs to be part of a grand plan. And look for, look for dynamics, look for opportunities. And ultimately, we will all be better for this tussle. And the sooner we reverse or at least arrest the rate of climate change, the rate of carbon dumping in the atmosphere, we will be better for it individually and our lineage demonstrably so. And I, I agree entirely. And you know, one of the other topics that uh, came up and another trait of, of leadership um, was curiosity um, and, and knowing how to look at and examine at these problems and think of it crit critically. Another trait that came up in our discussion yesterday was resilience. Um, and uh, perhaps you can speak a little bit about that quality of Winston Churchill's leadership, which is legendary. Uh, he was perhaps, uh, you know, if you look up the, the dictionary definition of, of resilience, there might be Churchill's picture. Uh, but, uh, you know, the importance of uh, that trait of leadership, um, resilience, um, in your own experience, for instance, uh, in, in, when, 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 when tackling uh, big issues. Well, I mean, it starts if, if we're really focused on young people a lot, and, and I have experience in bringing up, you know, a lot of 18 year olds, 22 year olds who enter the workforce, oftentimes for the first time in speaking with them about trials in life. And the resilience I speak of oftentimes begins in academia, where they are fabulous students in high school and they come into college or they come into graduate school and by George, they're not the smartest person in the class. Uh, they are not the, 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 the one of the three people who get the A. And oftentimes that troubles them and they seek other opportunities in life versus persevering, persevering, uh, having the resilience to tarry forth uh, and that goes in a lot of areas. Uh, we, you know, sometimes the endeavors almost appear to be Sisyphusian. You just don't think you're making any way. But the resilience on an individual basis, uh, knowing that uh, additional effort, a, additional uh, enlightenment can make a difference. I have found that uh, Churchill's basic quote of never give in works so well in life, especially when you know you're right and you're as, uh, as, as self-actualized on the topic as you can be. Just keep working at it. The other, on the subject of never giving in, someone, you know, we had a conversation here at Westminster College uh, last week uh, about service uh, and leadership and you know, entering either military service or into the political arena um, or public service. Um, you know, it, it, it's a difficult arena uh, and you have to have a thick skin. Churchill famously said, I think, and I'm paraphrasing here, but you know, in life you can be killed once in politics many times. Um, and there are there are young leaders right now who are um, somewhat reluctant to get into a, a life of public service um, because of the divisiveness and in, in some ways the fear. As a student I was talking to last week, you know, I, I, I don't have I, I don't need that in my life. <laughs> you know, how do we overcome? You know, to encourage these leaders uh, to. You know, there's one thing about never giving in. But there's another thing about never getting into the battle, you know, never getting into the service because you don't feel like it. You know, how, how do we encourage and motivate uh, young leaders to actually enter the arena, uh, you know, in an arena that, that's not always welcoming? 
Well, um, indeed. So as you know, I ran for office. Um, I think versus, um, and, and you don't need to, to live a life of purity either. Um, so, so you need to be concerned about uh, some, some wayward word once spoken. Uh, rather, calling and raising money is, to me, the most, most noisome aspect of running for office. Uh, and, and, you, and you've got to leave a little bit uh, on the table with the expectation that people realize that some vacuous comments about you, some false media, some misinterpretation is going to happen. And here again about the, the resilience. Uh, as you're running for office, you can speak to, I just got off the phone with a, a person who was a senator for almost 30 years. And numerous times in his career, he thought he was toast because of something. And uh, you find out that the electorate is rather forgiving, uh, rather understanding, and rather encouraging that you shake that off and you tarry for it. And uh, so I, I have, uh, I worked at State Department in the United States here, uh, mentoring a, a consortium of students on how to be a better manager of a large organization. And uh, I found that across the board in that room, they were so fabulous as individuals, so proud that they were involved in government service that I was always offended when somebody said something negative about government workers. I've been around government workers my entire life. I am a farm kid from Iowa. My dad was a blacksmith. Uh, we, we, we weren't born with any silver spoon or any kind of sense of elitism. And nor are most of the people, the vast majority of people in government service. They are people who have an altruistic manner about them and they want to do well. So it's not for everybody, but if you are a servant leader and you're eager to be helpful to your fellow humankind, then I urge you at some stage of your life to go into some service. And it doesn't have to be military service. It doesn't have to be in politics, but there's USAID, uh, there's an inner city school teacher. There is some tough job out there where you can take a hiatus from what you were trained to do perhaps and enter that and give it your all because it's a part of giving back to society that I think it's incumbent upon all of us to do at some stage of, their, of our lives. Um, thank you for, for that. Switching gears now from kind of the, the broad to the, to the more specific, I'd like to, to focus for a moment on a topic you know well, um, Africa. Um, and considering our, our global audience for, for this round table, um, you you were very much uh, entrenched, literally, uh, in, in in African affairs from a military perspective. But um, what are can you can you talk a little bit about the importance of the continent of Africa globally um, from a from a, um, a geopolitical standpoint? I think, uh, particularly here in the United States, um, it doesn't come up in conversation every day. As as you know, we talk about we still talk about Europe. Uh, we talk about China, uh, Asia, uh, but we, 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 don't, uh, we don't perhaps pay as much attention to, to the continent of Africa. Uh, is that a mistake? <laughs> that wasn't the leading question, but I will, I will act like it was because the first time I visited Africa was in the early 80s. And... Um, uh, it struck me as, my word, what fabulous country, what beautiful people, what, uh, what mass of humanity that is waiting to be fully tapped uh, into the politic for, for locally, regionally, 
continent-wide and internationally. Uh, I had a choice at one time to stay all Navy and go on a strike group and be the admiral on a carrier and all that business. I chose to go on the ground in Africa because it was uh, indicative of the development, diplomacy, and defense slash security that we have in Central Asia, Southeast Asia, worldwide at one stage of a regionals, a region's development, the necessity. Uh, I found it to be a fabulously rich experience that I draw on every day. And so, you know, uh, I read the, the Blue and the White Nile books uh, with great interest and, um, and, and Churchill's readings from on the Nile and elsewhere uh, and his discussions with Mary Soames um, many times about, about Morocco. I, I've left my heart in Africa. As a matter of fact, if I could ask for one job in life to end my life, the last of all jobs, it would be to be the person to congeal the continent under a rural continent-wide electrification program. Because only then will we see that continent of over a billion people reaching the preeminence that ultimately it will achieve. It'll ju just fast forward that. Um, also, just to get a sense of that, to remember a few numbers, uh, depending on which demo demographics you, you rely on, by 2035 to 2040 timeframe, a mere blink of an eye, Half the people entering the workforce worldwide will be from the continent of Africa, and most of them south of the Sahal. Uh, and I, my job in, in and I, I can go on on this in a long, on a long way, uh, but my job was to work with the Chinese in some in some areas where we could be mutually beneficial to the local population, where their project teamed with the US or another international agency's pro project could be combined to be an enhanced effort for the region. And sometimes to work against them uh, or to illuminate what I found to be unhelpful projects or the local government with a full observation of self-determination for each government. Uh, basic things like 60% of the unstressed farmland in the world is in Africa. I keep up a map of it right here with the pinpricks in all the places I've been. Uh, it is of premier importance and I think it is a positive aspect of the last administration that they put forth an, op an opportunity uh, for the government to help U.S. industries in developing businesses on the continent. And, and uh, so I, my hope for in the future is that we talk about work in Africa as much as we talk about work in East Asia. Well, thank, th thank you for that. Um, and I think it's been very um, wonderful for this, this, on this global platform for us here at, at Fulton and America's Natural Churchill Museum to explore Churchill's relationship to Africa uh, in the last month or so. We have um, Jim Miller's wonderful new um, book uh, or, 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 or project of uh, Churchill's uh, River War uh, publication that's recently come out uh, back in its two volume form for the first time in over a hundred years. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, Churchill's time in South Africa and the, the Boer War um, and his time uh, in Uganda uh, with, uh, you know, shortly before you were there, uh, and, you know, Churchill's visit uh -huh. in 1907 uh, that resulted in his book, his 1908 book, My African Journey. It was certainly a continent uh, that Churchill paid a lot of attention to. You also mentioned uh, Churchill's time and, and love affair with Morocco and Marrakech, where he did some of his great paintings uh, and, and, and had uh, many, many holidays 
um, and, and was fascinated with that. So I think you know, you're, you're following in, in, the, in the footsteps and that's something that in the Churchill world, the larger Churchill world, um, we, we, we are, are often times perhaps not, 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 not um, given as much attention to the time that, that, that Churchill spent in all parts of Africa, but, but, but should. And as, as in so many things, we can be informed and inspired by, by Churchill uh, on, on the continent of, of Africa. Um, I'd like to invite our, our, our viewers uh, and, and those who are tuning in and other panelists who may be uh, uh, um, from the earlier session uh, to also submit questions. Uh, we do have a little bit of time left uh, to, 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 to submit some of your, to, to answer some of your questions. You know, one that came up um, about uh, current affairs, uh, Admiral, I'd, I'd like to get your, your opinion uh, on, uh, but geopolitically, um, and as far as global threats, um, what do you, would you, what do you think of, of the United States policy? And this is a question that is, is posed uh, from, a, from a viewer here in, in Fulton um, of the Biden administration to, 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 to continue um, President Trump's um, um, declaration to, to pull out of Afghanistan. Uh, maybe not today, as originally projected by by the Trump May first, but but late in September. Um, from a geopolitical standpoint, um, what what's your take on uh, on that decision? Well, what a surprise you asked. <laughs> um, so I have history here, going back many years, and I will say that if you do a conditions based departure when your conditions are not integer based then you will have a very difficult time of ever leaving and a brave man a brave person doesn't run from a conflict after having been engaged it takes i think an element of bravery to say no mas that we will do this in another way. Uh, I am perhaps in a minority in saying that this is time, we're past time, that with additional diplomatic and humanitarian and um, industrial assistance with ourselves and many other nations, that the determination, the self-determination by the Afghans, it is time. And do I think that there will be negative repercussions, especially to the females on the continent? I'm afraid that's true. But ultimately, to an individual, to a person, to a clan leader, to a business person, a teacher, a farmer, it's incumbent upon them and the regions, the Pakistanis, uh, the Persians and others to assist their neighbor in a peaceful coexistence and a prosperous future. I wish we, during our time, we would have done better in bringing about infrastructure advancements, uh, but I will say in many cases in Afghanistan, the infrastructure is far superior to where it is in Africa. And yet exports and trade and standard of living in Africa in that area is superior to Afghanistan. And at one time, I spoke to an association of mayors in, uh, Larne, Scott, uh, or, uh, in Belfast, Northern Ireland. One of the first time that the association from both sides of the table came together. And I was asked the question, what does America think of the troubles in, in Northern Ireland? And my response was, we are sad that adults would so denigrate the future of their children. Uh, and I think the same goes for Afghanistan that it's time for the adults to become adults and do what's best for the future of their children. And a 14th century madras is not it. 
Well, um, the I'm going to to to, to yield the, the the time here to our, our colleagues in East Africa um, at the Churchill Institution uh, and Ashado, who and together with his team has been brilliant in organizing this two day session for, for the last word. Uh, but before before we do, uh, I want to once again thank you, uh, Admiral Franken, for your your uh, cogent and wise words, uh, for your service, uh, and for your uh, informed experience. Uh, you've enlightened us all today, and, and we're very much appreciative and fortunate uh, to have you uh, on the Churchill team still. Uh, and uh, we're, we're very pleased, and, and thank you again for being with us. Pleased to. Thank you so much. Okay. Ashadu, back to you in, in, in Uganda uh, and the Churchill Institute of East Africa uh, for the final word uh, for today's uh, Global Roundtable. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Vice Admiral Mike Ben Franken, for sharing with us your leadership skills. Uh, very much appreciated. Thank you very much for being with us, for your contribution to the first annual Global Churchill Leaders Roundtable Discussion Series 2021. Thank you so much all for joining, participating, and sharing your experience and knowledge with us. Uh, we look forward to, have, to having a lot, of more, a lot more engagement with us, including uh, the first annual Churchill Public Lecture here in Uganda. So thank you very much uh, for your participation. Uh, and uh, thank you in particular, Dr. Milan Adams, she was with us yesterday, and Mr. Alan Parkwood uh, from Cambridge University, Major General Bylan S. Bagby, um, Mrs. Sheko, she, she's, she's uh, here with us right now, Guy Rosell, Mr. Robert Shafe, and then a retired US Navy Vice Admiral. Mike and Frank, thank you very much uh, for being with us. Uh, thank you very much.